be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to Living with Reality, a podcast featuring archived teachings and modern conversations with Dr. Robert Svoboda, brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. Living with Reality explores Ayurveda and other wisdom traditions of India, which Dr. Svoboda has been studying for nearly 50 years. For more information, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dr. Svoboda. That's D-R-S-V-O-B-O-D-A. Hello, and welcome to Living with Reality. I'm Paula Crossfield, your host and Dr. Svoboda's media manager. On this week's episode, Dr. Svoboda tells the story of the churning of the ocean of milk. He did this live about a month ago, and so you may have heard it before, but this is a classic story of the Vedic traditions about how the origin of so many things came to be. And it's an important story that also tells you more about the potency, the importance of Lord Shiva. So please stay tuned for that. Meanwhile, if you would like to study with Dr. Svoboda, he has a number of courses available at Dr. Svoboda, that's S-V-O-B-O-D-A dot teachable dot com including him telling the Ramayana with a lot of the more subtle meaning. And it's about a six hour long course with some chanting and um, lots of great in-depth information about the epic. So check that out. There's also a number of other courses and many, many hours of content there. So we hope that you enjoy it. Om Shri Ganeshaya Namaha. Vakritanda Mahakaya Surikoti Samaprabha Nirvignam Kurume Deva Sarvakar Yeshu Sarvadam Om Sarva Mangal Mangalye Shive Sarvat Sadike Sharanye Triambake Gauri Narayani Namastute Om Triambakam Jamahe Sugandim Pashti Vardhanam Urva Rukmeva Vandanan Vatur Mukshi Yamam Vatatu Mukam Karuti Bachalam Pangum Langhayate Girim Yat Krupa Tamaham Vande Paramananda Madhavam Om Namo Narayanaya. Samudra Mantana, the churning of the ocean, the ocean of milk. As Vimalananda was fond of <clears throat> commenting, all Indian myths have many layers of meaning. And the really, the really important myths, he like, used to like to say, have Set at least seven different layers of seven different perspectives from which they can be interpreted. This is certainly one of those myths, and it is worthy of being interpreted in many ways. I'm going to focus on two ways this time, and those two ways are the external or cosmic or, or the Davic way and the internal or micro, the macrocosmic and the microcosmic. It is also a, a myth regarding astronomy um, because th- there is, there was the understanding early on that the sun seemed to shift during a year. It seemed to shift from one side of the sky to another. During Uttarayana, when it appears to move into the north, it appears to move into the north. And then during Dakshinayana, 
um, it appears to move into the south. So we're moving, we have just moved into the Uttarayana phase. We've, it's, the sun has moved as far south in the northern hemisphere as it's going to, and it's going to start moving north again. And that happens, that happens at the winter solstice, though it is commemorated in India when the sun actually moves into the constellation of Capricorn, which happens on Makara Sankranti, usually January the 14th. And there were people who, for some period of time, believed that that was happening in the, in, among the stars also, because it was noted that the stars seemed to shift a little bit over a period of time. Like where the North Star was, the North Star seemed to be moving in a certain direction. So people at one point thought maybe it'll just move this much this far, and then it will start moving back in the other direction. After a while, they figured out that no, it was moving only in one direction, and that's called by the, that's due to the precession of the equinoxes. And that's a very long cycle. That's a 25,000 year cycle. So there's, there's a lot is packed into the, all of these really important big myths, and a lot is packed into this one. So, but I'm gonna focus just on these two general meanings. And as is usually the right place to begin, we're going to begin with the reason, or at least the reason that is given, the reason that is given for this to be happening in the first place. And the reason that is given is that Indra, who was always getting into some kind of trouble. Indra is the king of the Vedic gods. He's the king of the Vedic gods. And as such, in the Vedas, he's very important. But once you get to the Puranas and the Itihasas and the Tantras, he is very, he's almost a figure of, of fun. He's always doing something that is displaying how how non-supreme he is. So in this particular case, Indra is riding around on an elephant because he is the king of the gods, naturally, and the king in India often rode around on an elephant. For many centuries, if not millennia, the king would ride on an elephant because that elephant is a sign of rajatva, of kingliness or queenliness. And sometimes people identify this elephant as Airavata, who is, in fact, Indra's elephant. Though actually, since Airavata is supposed to be emerging as one of the Ratnas, one of the jewels from the ocean of milk, it's hard to see how he could be riding on Airavata when Airavata has not yet been created. So I think let's just have him ri be riding on some other celestial elephant who shall remain nameless at the moment, since we, uh, it's hard to believe that it could be Airavata, since Airavata has not yet been, uh, has not yet emerged. In any event, Indra is riding around on his elephant, and he runs into, but not literally, he encounters, wherever it is he is riding, somewhere in heaven, he encounters the extremely irritable sage Durvasas. And Durvasas is extremely irritable. He is regarded as being the incarnation of Shiva, and Shiva represents Tamas. So Durvasas is the incarnation of Tamas. His brother is the, he has two brothers. One is the moon, who is the incarnation of Regis, because the moon is moving around in the sky, changing shape all the time, the moon. And there is also Dattatreya, who is the incarnation of Sattva, and generally is regarded as being beyond all three gunas, which is why he's called Dattatreya. He has given up the, th he is the, given to Atreya, his father, Atri Rishi, but 
he has given up the treya, the three, the three gunas. He's just, he doesn't bother with them. So Durvasa has two eminent brothers, and Durvasa is extremely irritable. And you would have thought that Indra would remember this and be on his best behavior. But when your karmas, and Indra has karmas like everybody else, when your karmas, which according in India, or they say are written on your forehead, when your karmas are not so good, then you will be blinded. You will not be able to see things clearly. So Durvasas came up and gave Indra a special garland. Now, if Durvasas was to come to me and give me a special garland, I would first be terrified to figure out what to do with the garland, but then I would definitely hold it myself and wait for him to tell me what to do with it or something because he's ready to curse anybody at any moment. Indra, however, put the garland onto his elephant, thinking I shall display to Durvasas that I respect his uh, garland because I am placing it on my magnificent elephant. Mm, I, th- I personally think that was a mistake. Clearly, it, <laughs> it became a mistake because the flowers were so fragrant they attracted a bunch, a, a swarm of bees, because bees always like fragrant flowers. Now, of course, we're in heaven, so these are celestial bees. And as it turns out, the, the great goddess, Devi, incarnates, one of her incarnations is as a gigantic swarm of bees or wasps or six-legged flying extremely irritable animals. And um, so uh, it's possible that Davy is involved here somewhere, but, but we, we, that's only a possibility. It's very important not to read too much into the myth and to try to, and to not miss what is really obvious in the myth. And I don't claim to be an expert, but I'm following generally what Vimalananda told me. It turns out that one of the things that elephants in, in this world really hate is bees. In fact, in South India, where there are many elephants who often like to eat the crops that humans would prefer to have, one way of keeping the elephants away from your crops is to raise bees, to put beehives in strategic positions around your fields And then when the elephants are around and if they happen to run into a beehive, the bees are going to become very irritable and they will encourage the elephant to move elsewhere. So this particular elephant may have been a celestial elephant, but there was the garland, there were the bees. The elephant was very irritated by the garland and he threw the garland on the ground to get the bees away from him which was the right thing for the elephant to do and the wrong thing for Indra to permit to happen. Indra could have grabbed hold of the garland, but anyway, it didn't happen. Garland landed up on the ground. This gave Durvasas the excuse he was waiting for. He became enraged. He cursed Indra, and he didn't stop with Indra. He cursed all of the devas, and he said, you will lose all of your strength, all of your energy, all of your good fortune. Everything will go. Now, it is said that a curse of a rishi eventually turns into a blessing, which was the case here. But at that moment, Indra was uh, really, really disturbed because as soon as the asuras who are the half-brothers of the devas, and there's a real sibling rivalry between them, as soon as the Usuras found out what had happened, they immediately attacked heaven, conquered heaven, gained control over the universe, and their king, Bali, was the potentate of the entire cosmos. And he was happy. Indra, on the other hand, was not so happy, and he became very dejected. And he also became extremely forlorn, as did all the other devas who said, Indra, we were minding our own business, and here you misused the garland of Durvasas, and now we are suffering for your foolishness. So now Indra was being insulted by all of his subjects also. 
So Ender said, OMG, I need to deal with the situation right now. So he went to Brahma, the creator, and Brahma said, I don't know, let's go to Vishnu. And they went to Vishnu and Vishnu said, it turns out that the current time in the universe is not appropriate for you. It is appropriate for the Asuras. That's why they have, they have done so well. You must wait until time turns in your favor. Meanwhile, let us do something useful. Let us churn the ocean of milk so that we can, we can obtain Amrita, the nectar of immortality. Now, Amrita, according to Vimalananda, so we, this has been happening up on the celestial Adidavic level, but Vimalananda says Amrita is a glandular substance. It's something being produced in your brain. And as, as has the yogis have been saying for many centuries, Ordinarily, what happens to the amrita is that it drips down into your stomach, and there the jatra agni, the digestive fire in your stomach and your intestines, destroys it. And that's why we are mortals. We live in mrityu loka, the place where people die, because we don't have access to this amrita. So one of the purposes of kundalini yoga is to be able to obtain this imrita and thereby become immortal. So Vishnu is saying, so now we're reading this as this is happening. Indra represents the Indriyas, the king of the Indriyas. The Indriyas means the sense organs. So Indra is the king of the sense organs, the way that you can perceive what's going on on the outside. The devas are your good thoughts, the thoughts you have about doing good things and being generally unselfish, generally. And this asuras are the selfish gods. They're the selfish thoughts, the thoughts of, I want to do this for myself. So on the inside, in the microcosm, what has happened is you have done some not so good karmas, which has caused tamas to increase in you and you have become selfish, and you now need to conquer your heaven, heaven is in the head, you need to conquer that back from your selfish self and return to a self that is more open to being transformed into something celestial. And Vishnu says, you need to realize that you can't simply do that automatically. The time, you, there is time. Time is going to be required. And what's going to be required is churning the ocean of milk, which, among other things, is the, all the juices in the head, but the juices in the body also, because only if the juices in the body are balanced is the, are the juices in the head going to be properly balanced out too. So, the devas wisely took Vishnu's advice, and they, they made peace with the asuras and they said, we'll all get some amrita and we'll all enjoy it together and everything will be great. And the asuras said, we're game, we would like to be immortal also. So they added all kinds of medicinal grasses and bushes and creepers and plants into the ocean of milk. And then they started to churn. And they, if you have ever, it, it, and nowadays it's not very common, but in, in the past in India, if you were going to drink lassi, which is yogurt that has been churned, you would just, you would have a churning rod, a, which would have some uh, little uh, protuberances on the end, some little blades on the end. And you would actually, you would put a, a rope around it and you would do like this, you would churn it. So that's what they're doing to this milk. But now they've added medicinal things to it and they are churning it. And, or rather they're starting to try to churn it. What are they using as the churning rope? They're using Vasuki, who is a Nagaraja. He's a king of the Nagas, of these serpent beings, which represents the Kundalini Shakti. 
So this is a prana. This is inside, you're using your prana for this purpose. Outside, they're using the Nagaraja, Vasuki, who normally is around Shiva's neck, but he has not been around, he's not around Shiva's neck yet, or maybe Shiva uh, <clears throat> contributed him, we're not certain, that's not, that's not obvious. And they are trying to churn, and they, as the, as the churning rod, they're using Mount Mandara. And Mount Mandara is a celestial mountain externally, and on the inside, it is a collective name for the entire spinal cord, which is sometimes called the Himalaya, the range of mountains, because each of those vertebrae is like a mountain. But taken together, they're calling them Mount Mandara. So you're churning it, you're moving the piranha up and down, you're moving the piranha from side to side, you're moving the piranha around inside you. <clears throat> but it turns out that um, when they tried to start just doing it on its own, um, down went Mount Mandara to the bottom of the ocean because it was too heavy. So. You start to do this, and if you don't have good control over your prana, then your prana and apana are not going to be properly aligned, and, and, and the energy that you try to bring upwards is just going to go back downwards again. So what you require is the second incarnation of the blessed Vishnu as kurma, Kurma, the primordial tortoise, turtle or tortoise. And so what Vishnu does is he puts himself under Mount Mandara and right there you are able to churn. Mandara stays there, it does not sink, and then you're able to churn it. Now, in yoga, they sometimes talk about the tortoise at the navel, because there are nadis, celestial uh, uh, etheric nerves that come out of the navel, kind of like the four legs and the two and the head and the tail of the tortoise. And so externally, the tortoise is Lord Vishnu. Internally, it is this plexus of, na of uh, nadis at the navel. So in order for this to work internally, you have to have the muladhara turned into an, a real adhara. Adhara means foundation. So it is the root foundation, but if you have not created a good foundation, upon is just going to continue exiting downward. So you have to be able to move upon upward. First, you create a good foundation at the muladhara chakra, and then at the kurma, here at the navel, that's where the churning is going to really happening happen. And they say in the Srimad Bhagavata that the high and low tides we find in the ocean, the big ocean around us, come from the breath of the divine turtle as he was being lulled to sleep by the scratching of Mount Mandara on his back during the churning. So the churning is going on and the asuras, because they are selfish gods, they have a high opinion of themselves. And the asuras <clears throat> demanded that they should hold on to the head of Vasuki. And the devas said, that's fine, you can have, you were great, you to hold on to the head. Now, what happened is that as the churning was happening, Vasuki found that he was being extremely annoyed. And of course, Nagas, cobras have venom. So the venom started to emerge and it blasted the Asuras. But they're tough guys, so they continued. Vishnu had been kind enough to make Vasuki resistant to pain and he entered the hearts of both the devas and the asuras and gave, made them bold so they could do the job. In the words of the Srimad Bhagavatam, 
With the furious abandon of drunkards, they churn to the ocean with all their might and main, causing wild consternation among all the aquatic creatures. Meaning, everything in the ocean became completely uh, con confounded because suddenly the entire ocean was being churned in all directions. Meanwhile, the Asuras are being blasted by the venom from Vasuki, so the Devas are over here at the tail, they're kind of chuckling, and the process is going on. They're churning, churning, churning. When you churn butter, this is what you have to do. You do the same kind of churning, and eventually the fat separates itself from the water. In the case of this churning, the first thing to emerge was not the fat, was not the butter, was not the, the best part. It was the worst part. It was the notorious hala hala poison. Hala means to move, to be unstable, to be mobile. Oh uh, hala means completely stable, immobile. Hala hala means that thing that even if you are completely stable and completely set in your organism, this is going to cause you to become unstable and fall over and die. So it's a really serious poison, the hala hala poison. And the hala hala poison being the, the essence of poison in the entire cosmos was about to destroy the cosmos. So suddenly everybody realized, OMG, the only person we can go to now is we must immediately go to Lord Shiva, because only he knows how to deal with poisons. He is the king of poisons. Oh, and they went to Shiva and said, ah, what do we do now? And Shiva said, wait. And so he said, okay, there's only one thing to do. I will drink the poison and hold it inside me. So he drank it, but he did not swallow it. He holds it at his throat. And it was such a strong poison, it turned his throat blue. And this is why he is called Nilakanta, Mr. Blue Throat. And it is said that a little bit of the poison leaked and it ended up on earth as the poison of scorpions and snakes and herbs and things like that. Vimalananda asked one day when he was telling this story, he liked to tell the story, why does Shiva even bother to need to do penance? He is already... He's already in samadhi all the time. Why does, but we see Shiva doing penance all the time. Why is he doing it? And Vimalananda said, it's because the hala hala poison is still there. He has to keep it continuously protecting the world from being destroyed by continuously having to keep that poison under control. And why does he care about the world? Honestly, he doesn't care about that much about the world, but he does care about Gopala Krishna, who is his Ishta Devata. And he does not want Gopala or anything that is associated with Gopala, including all of the bhaktas of Krishna, to be damaged in any way. And therefore he protects the universe and he is continuously having to deal with this poison. So, and Vimalananda would go on to say is when you're churning your own consciousness to separate yourself from the poison of the samsara, that's going to emerge in you as the hala hala. And you're going to have to keep it right here in your throat. Don't let it go down into your body or you, your body will be poisoned and then your mind will be poisoned. Don't keep it in your mind because your mind will be poisoned and your body will be poisoned. Keep it at the border, the boundary between your body and your mind. And Vimalananda would say, when you become a serious sadhaka, someone who seriously is serious about spirituality, you've got to keep the outside world outside. You've got to cultivate interiority. Otherwise, you get poisoned. You have to stop identifying with the external world not just your limited ego personality, but the kundalini shakti in particular, which remember, ahankara and kundalini, same thing. So, 
Once the poison was out of the way, now all kind of great things started to come out. These are the ratnas, the jewels. And different sources, different Puranas, different, different the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, they all have a slightly different list of ratnas. But what we can agree on is there are several that are there everywhere, and they, everything that came out was great once the halahala was taken care of. There was the Kamadenu, the wish-fulfilling cow. The rishis took that so they could be doing um, yagas, sacrifices, by using her milk and ghee and cow dung and so on. Next came the celestial horse, Ucheshravas, means uplifted ear, Ucheshravas. And Bali, king of the Asuras, requested that horse for himself. Then came out Airavata, the celestial elephant. Who, and Indra said, if you're taking the horse, I'm taking the elephant. So that went to Indra. Then there was the Kaushtuba gem, a special jewel, which Vishnu placed on his own chest because Vishnu said, I'm, uh, <laughs> this is working because of me, so I'm going to take something too. The sixth, or the next treasure was the Kulpa Vriksha, <clears throat> the wish-fulfilling tree, which they transplanted into heaven. Then there were a multitude of absurdices, abs celestial damsels, and everybody was, uh, was astounded by them. Then there was Lakshmi, goddess of prosperity. Vishnu took her also. And the Asuras were... When they were abandoned by Lakshmi, they lost all of their higher qualities, including valor, restraint, and cooperation. And they instead, they saw, huh, Vishnu is taking Lakshmi. We need to take something. After Lakshmi, who came out? Varuni, the goddess of, of alcohol, of spirit, spirituous liquors. And the Asura said, we're taking her because... You took the Lakshmi, we're taking her. And Vishnu said, go right ahead. Take all the alcohol you want. Get very drunk if you would like. Goodbye. And some people say that Vishnu's bow also emerged and his conch shell and maybe even the moon. In any event, the last thing to emerge was the thing they had all been waiting for. And that was the pot of nectar, the amrita. And it emerged in the hand of Danwantari, who is an incarnation of Vishnu as the god of medicine, Danwantari. And the Asuras immediately grabbed hold of the pot and they were all going to take it. And the devas were terrified, but Vishnu had already realized what was going to happen. So Vishnu, in a new avatar, suddenly emerges as Mohini. Mohini means the enchantress. So Mohini is the most beautiful image of, an, of a being that has ever been seen anywhere in the cosmos. There is nothing like Mohini. And everybody, and moha means delusion. By definition, everybody who sees Mohini is immediately deluded. Vishnu's maya deludes them immediately. Even Shiva later on was deluded by Mohini, but that's a different story. Meanwhile, Mohini appears, and the, De the Asuras forget the Amrita, kind of, and the Devas forget the Amrita, kind of, and everybody is allured by Mohini. And Mohini says, let's, let's not fight over this. I shall distribute the Amrita to everyone. Trust me. And when you hear Vishnu say, when you're hear Krishna in particular saying, trust me, that's when you should start worrying. You have to trust him, but he has something planned for you. Vishnu had something planned, and that was to cheat the Asuras out of the Amrita. Because of this, in the Vamana Avatara, Avatara number five, Vishnu is going to have to go and beg the universe back from Bali. So even Vishnu has to uh, follow the law of karma. But at this moment, he, re he, is, he understands that the thing we have to do is not give the amrita to the asuras. So Mohini says, I'm going to handle everything. And, and the devas, of course, are very happy. 
uh, and the Asuras are overwhelmed because they think maybe we can possess her too. And they say, whatever you say, beautiful woman, we will do. And, but they're not even thinking about it because they are completely overwhelmed by their craving for this unbelievable Mohini. So Mohini has everybody sit down and she's extraordinarily gorgeous and she's wearing almost nothing. So everyone is looking at her body and they're even more mesmerized. And she is passing out the Amrita and somehow nobody notices that she's passing all the Amrita out to the devas. Nobody notices except a particular surah named Swarbanu. And Swarbanu notices this. Hmm. So he puts a costume of a deva on and he goes to sit between the sun and the moon. And he manages to get one drop of the amrita before the sun and the moon actually realize that, wait a minute, we don't know this guy. Ah, he's in the surah. And they say to Mohini, he's in the surah. And Mohini takes her Sudarshana chakra. Note, note the word, Vishnu's weapon is the Sudarshana chakra, the chakra of good vision, of accurate sight. So when that, this Swarabhanu is seen accurately, he is perceived to be an Asura, his head is chopped off, but a drop of the Amrita has landed on his tongue. Therefore, his head becomes immortal. Later, his body becomes immortal, and they live on as Rahu and Ketu, the two nodes of the moon where eclipses take place. So Rahu is always swallowing the moon and the sun and trying to kill them because they had him killed, but he has no body, so they go through, and once they get to the throat, they emerge again, the eclipse is over, everybody's happy except Rahu, who is never happy because he never actually gets a chance to digest either the sun or the moon. Sun, moon, the sun channel on the right nostril, moon channel on the left nostril, Rahu in between, again, the limited personality. That personality is now a shadow, the Chayagraha. It's now a shadow, but it still is there. Uh, it's said that where Rahu's blood fell on the earth, there is the garlic came up and garlic is, has the medicinal qualities of Amrita, but the tama, tamas qualities of Rahu. So gar, garlic is a good medicine, but it will make your mind full of tamas. And of course, once <laughs> Rahu has his head chopped off, of course, uh, the Asuras suddenly, uh, suddenly wake up the spell is broken and they see, O-M-G, we have been cheated out of all the Amrita and Mohini was no one, none other than Vishnu and they grab all their weapons and there's a big battle. But of course, the Devas have just been invigorated by the Amrita and the Asuras have been defeated, they are defeated and as Vimalananda points out, this is the same thing that happens when Amrita is produced inside you, if you are able to produce it. Now, Amrita and Ojas, there is a connection between the two, though it's an obscure connection. It's kind of almost like Amrita is the even more refined version of Ojas. Ojas is the thing that, that controls your immunity, that integrates all the different parts of your organism, all your, your koshas, and it's sort of like Amrita is extracted even from Ojas. So the same kind of struggle is happening on the inside. When, you, when the Amrita is produced, when, when, when there is, when there is, is, is a clarity of, of mind and, and, and alertness and intelligence and so on, all of your selfish, all of the selfish aspects of your personality want their share but if you're doing good sadhana, your spirit will delude your personality. Eventually, your personality will realize, what are you doing? And it will fight back. But hopefully by that time, 
that amrita will have strengthened the good parts of your personality. Those are the parts that are actually doing serious sadhana. And you will destroy them. Of course, the asuras can always be brought back to life by shukracharya and your selfish aspects of your personality eventually will revive and fight again. But in the same way, if you keep chopping down some weeds, eventually they're going to become weaker because you are you're extracting their energy every time they grow up again and you chop them down so long as you don't strengthen them. This is why sadhana is so important and it's important for you and me as human beings here in Mrityu Loka and it's important for people like Indra who should have been doing enough sadhana to avoid the whole uh, uh, situation in the first place. So may Lord Shiva always protect us from the poison of the samsara. May he protect us externally as Nilakanta. May he protect us internally as Nilakanta. May Lord Vishnu, who managed this entire situation, manage everything so that the asuras externally and internally are always weakened and, and prevented from having the amrita. And the, may the amrita always go to where it needs to go, which is to facilitate our own transformation in a positive way. And at the end of this year, well, I mean, it's very soon to be the end of this year, may the next year, may we all, each one of us, confirm our intention to move in the direction of transform positive transformation Il, can facil, preventing the selfish aspects of ourselves from gaining the upper hand, always keeping them under the control of our focus on moving towards the Supreme. Om Namah Shivaya and Happy New Year to everyone. <laughs>